still in searching for that perfect album. Maybe I'll never do it or I'll never find it, but uh, I'm gonna die trying. Enrique Iglesias, an international Latin pop star who was determined to find his own path to success and not be overshadowed by his world-famous father, Julio Iglesias. This is not just a Latino artist. This is not just a crossover U.S. artist. He is famous everywhere. Enrique always seemed to have an affinity for music. Obviously, it wasn't his blood. In 1995, Enrique dropped out of university to debut his first album, which proved to be a huge success. This paved the way to stardom for Enrique as he achieved several top five singles on the Billboard Hot 100, making him one of the top selling artists of our time. Enrique has definitely proved that he has a range and that he can uh, combat all sorts of different genres. Now he's a little bit more into like the dance, techno, pop genre, whereas before we would see him doing a lot of ballads. By 2014, he has sold more than 100 million records worldwide, amassed more than 70 number one rankings, voted as the sexiest singer alive, and has been labeled as the king of Latin pop. If a guy who looks like this sings about love, you bet he will have a lot of listeners in the female population. Follow the rise to success of the Latin hero, Enrique Iglesias. Enrique Iglesias was born in Madrid in 1975. His father, Julio Iglesias, would be the inspiration for Enrique's lust for stardom. He was exposed to his father's money, fame, and female attention from a young age, which inspired Enrique to pursue a career within the music industry. Julio Iglesias is the best-selling Latin artist in history. He's uh, recorded about 80 albums in 14 countries, and he's got over 2,600 albums, certified gold and platinum. So, I mean, if you have to set the standard high, I mean, Julio Iglesias has already done it. And for Enrique Iglesias to try to beat that, it must have been an exhausting feat. Can you imagine growing up in that household and your father is one of the biggest musicians out there globally, but he's also a big sex symbol. So, you know, you're being exposed to music, but you're also being exposed to that fame, the money, the ladies. It's uh, kind of exciting probably for a young boy to see that. Enrique continued to live in Madrid with his mother and siblings until 1986. A horrific event was about to unfold, which threatened to derail the family. His grandfather was kidnapped by Basque terrorists. Very dramatic thing to happen. They were concerned about the kid's safety. So they took uh, the two boys and sent him to live with Julio and his older sister stayed with his mother. So the family was split apart. Julio was at the height of his fame. He was traveling the world and he didn't have time to raise two boys. So he was raised by his nanny, Elvira. Very different environment, wasn't nurtured as much like by his mother. And of course his dad was absent. So it was tough. Eventually, you know, the grandfather was found by police, but it was a really tough time for the family. I mean, they were in the spotlight, they were vulnerable. Enrique was uprooted uh, quite a bit uh, during his formative years. And it's interesting, as tragic as it is at the moment to move between continents and languages and to make home um, every couple of years in a new country with new people surrounded. It's also very common about creative artists. A lot of them have uh, very unstable childhoods and maybe in the end that helped. Enrique went to Gulliver Preparatory School of Miami. Here he took part in a school production and astonished audiences. This was just the beginning of his musical talents. It wasn't something uh, when he was younger that he was really interested in. When he hit high school and did that production of Hello, Dolly, he thought, yeah, this might be something. And he started to explore it, but he wanted to explore it away from his dad. Enrique always seemed to have an affinity for music. Obviously, it wasn't his blood. Uh, he was, you know, he did a standout performance in Hello, Dolly at his school. And he actually kept it quiet. He didn't want his father to know of his interest in music. He didn't want his father to get in the way and to um, use his influences to 
like make it easier for him in the music industry. Throughout the next few years, Enrique developed a quenching thirst for making music. At the time, his family were pleased he was studying business at the University of Miami. But did Enrique have other things on his mind? It wouldn't be too much longer until his musical desire began to blossom. I think Enrique always wanted to become a musician, but he was sort of overshadowed by his father, and that's why he, in his, when he was a young man, he tried to do something completely different and basically suppress his natural talent or his natural longing, and he applied for business school. But you can only, you know, keep your talent in check for so long. In the back of his mind, he was thinking about music, and it became something that he thought more and more about while he was in college. So it was one of those things that he thought, can I do it? My dad's one of the biggest superstars, and there's sort of that conflict. Do you want to follow in the same career as your father? It almost seemed like Enrique was never really fully committed to studying business. He did it because his family wanted to have something safe as a career. They didn't want him to, you know, become an artist. But um, some of his friends have even said they weren't really sure if he was actually studying in school. They think he was probably playing a bit of hooky and was probably dedicating more time to his, uh, to his entertainment career. You can't deny your personality. despite the fact that his family wanted to um, see him studying business. And at the time, it was actually really expensive. It cost thousands of dollars for Enrique to rent a studio, and he was afraid of asking his father for the money, so he actually went to his nanny um, and asked to borrow the money from her. He um, didn't want to do it under his name. Like so many kids of famous parents, they, are, they fear that they will be compared, and he did not want to be compared to his famous dad. He wanted to do his own thing, and that's why he recorded his first tape under a different name. Yeah, two big things that you can sort of take away from this. The first of all, that music was really important to him and he wanted to pursue this, but he wanted to do it without his dad. He wanted to do it on his own talents and his own merits, so he took away that famous last name, threw in Martinez and said, all right, let's see what happens with this. Enrique even went on to make up a story that he was an unknown singer from Guatemala because he believed he could be successful in the industry without his father's help. A representative from the Mexican label Fonavisa saw the potential Enrique had and wanted Enrique to sign up. Without hesitation, Enrique dropped out of university and traveled to Toronto to record his first album with Fonavisa. Before you knew it, he was signed up and he was about to release his first album. His father actually didn't find out about it through Enrique. He found out about it through the press. And uh, let's say word on the street is uh, Julio wasn't too happy about it. He dropped out of college to record his album and he moved to Toronto. And that's actually where his very first album was recorded. And this was the start of his big career. In July 1995, he sold more than a half million copies of his first album, Enrique Iglesias, and it continued to sell rapidly over the coming three months. The album went gold in Portugal, and Enrique won a Grammy for Best Latin Pop Performance. So by today's standards, an album in the Latin world that does extremely well would sell about 85,000 copies. So for Enrique to have sold 500,000 at the time was an, a, like just a huge success. Uh, the album actually ended up going gold in Portugal. This album, for a debut album or for any album, it was um, the biggest success of the decade in the Hispanic market of the U.S. and in Latin America. This is huge. Selling over a half million copies in a language other than English is a really big deal. And this is his debut album. And everyone was going, what is happening? This is absolutely amazing. So right away, eyeballs were on him. Enrique's music career had just ignited. Winning the Grammy was a huge accomplishment for Enrique, considering all the struggles that he went through in the beginning, trying to raise money to even get some studio time. And it also proved that he wasn't going to be under his uh, father's shadow 
for a much longer time. This is really special because not only does it establish and solidify his choice of having a music career versus going into business, but it also establishes him as an artist outside of his father. He wasn't riding on his dad's coattails or anything else like that. He proved that I can do this. From the beginning on, from his very first demo tape on, he was in sort of a competition with his dad and this was the proof from the outside world that he indeed was a serious competitor and to be reckoned with. Situ de Vaso was a huge success for Enrique. It was heard all over Spanish radio, all over TV. It was a light rock ballad. And in the video, um, you see him going all around New York City with his lover, I guess. And uh, just innocent fun, you know, just going to different sites of New York City. And uh, apparently he was really nervous about doing the kissing scene in this black and white video. Me quedo aquí. Solo pensando en ti Si tú te vas El dolor me comerá This single was huge. It went number one on the Latin charts. And you start seeing that sex appeal that Enrique had. His father also had it too. But uh, kind of in a different, a more modern way. And if you look at the video, it fluctuates between black and white and color. And it's all about that passionate romance of, you know, if someone leaves you, what's it like when you reunite together? So you see a lot of Enrique making out. <laughs> Si tu te va, if you leave, is uh, established Enrique as a Latin lover from your dreams. It's a very romantic, almost road movie-like uh, seeing him in a girl. You can feel the tragic, even if you don't understand the words. You know something's going on. You know there's this love and passion, and you know it's going to end. It's what established him as a Latin lover type. In 1997, Enrique's stardom continued to rise with his release of the album Vivir. It topped the Latin singles charts and boosted Enrique's fame worldwide. He was nominated for an American Music Award, but competed against his father at the same time. His father went on to win the award, but Enrique performed live at the event, further expressing his undeniable talent. This album topped the Latin singles chart here in the U.S., as well as in other countries. Uh, there was a bit of conflict, though, towards the end of the promotion for this album because um, he was debating whether to switch labels. So Fonovisa, reportedly, uh, cut back on promotion for one of the videos called Ruleta Rusa. Um, not only did they really not promote it here in the U.S., but um, it was actually the theme song of a telenovela used on Univision, which is partly owned by Fonovisa's parent company, Televisa. And so instead of using Ruleta Rusa, they went for another song that uh, Enrique had uh, released earlier in the album promotion. He did so well. Um, he the sales of his album put him up there with other English music superstars. Not just Latin superstars, but English music superstars. And he had uh, three singles top the Latin charts. And again, each album, he gets better and better and bigger and bigger. So he knew exactly what he was doing. According to friends, Enrique was very nervous about the fact that he was competing against his father in this award show. Um, the thing that really put perhaps a further, a bigger strain in the relationship was when Julio actually won the award and went up on stage and said something to the effect that of, as long as I'll be on stage, I will continue competing with you, son. You're nominated against your dad and your dad's like, if I don't win, that's it, I'm out of here. Um, that talks about a lot of Latin pride, but it also shows you the fracture between the father and son that started years and years ago. And I think somebody, maybe Julio, was a little bit afraid that his son was going to eclipse him in his career. So this didn't help a situation at all. Even though you could always sense what his songs were about when um, Enrique started recording in English, 
he discovered uh, a whole new market. Finally, you could sing along, even if you didn't speak uh, Spanish, you know. You would always have some Spanish reference uh, in there, but it helps when you understand what somebody is singing about. And if a guy who looks like this sings about love, you bet he will have a lot of listeners in the female population. From a young age, Enrique had always admired all the huge American acts like Bruce Springsteen and U2, and he knew that um, entering the you know English-speaking market was going to be a big step for him. He was going to be able to reach a larger audience around the world, and he was going to hopefully make even more record sales. Obviously, this makes a big impact on his career because the Latin market is a smaller market. However, if you can cross over into that English language market, you've got the entire globe covered. 1998 proved to be one of the most successful years in Enrique's early career. He started dating supermodel Samantha Torres, as well as releasing his third album, Cosas del Amor, which earned him a platinum album and established Enrique as a solo artist with a global superstar status. Enrique and Samantha actually met at one of his concerts and they hit it off instantly. Um, they hit it off so well that their relationship actually lasted a couple of years. She was the December 1995 Playmate of the Month. So you know she was hot, no big deal. She did a lot of Playboy videos as well. He met her during the Colombian leg of his tour and they dated for about a year. So kind of a, a sizzling couple, um, didn't last a long time, but he definitely was starting to date famous people. Even though uh, Enrique has the looks of a Lothario, he's way more conservative um, in his um, love life than you would expect. And when he started dating Playboy model Samantha Torres, I was a Playboy, Playboy editor at the time, I remember very well. He was on the last leg of his world tour, he was in Colombia, and she was um, shooting a commercial, I think, and they met and fell in love. It didn't last very long, it lasted for maybe a year, their relationship, but it established him as a sex symbol because, you know, he was dating a Playboy model. Enrique was playing at packed out stadiums around the world. In Argentina, more than 130,000 people turned up at the arena. This tour led to Enrique performing his new album in even bigger venues and was the first concert tour to be sponsored by McDonald's. The stadium tour was very successful. It sold out through various arenas throughout the world. And actually, record execs didn't think that Enrique had what it took to be able to pull this off, but he was so persistent on doing something big, not just doing little venues. He wanted to do something huge, you know, the likes of his father or other way more established artists, and it actually paid off. Thanks uh, to the experience that he had seeing his father on stage, he was able to, you know, really control and manage the audience to a certain extent, and he was just a natural up there. Yeah, he had a lot of success with this album. Um, he had two singles that topped the Latin charts. This was also, and I thought this was really interesting, the first ever concert tour sponsored by McDonald's. No one else had been sponsored by McDonald's before, and Enrique was the very first one. This album also went gold in the United States. So again, he's making a huge impact on the English language market. At this point, Enrique had summed up 12 number one singles throughout his career. Enrique Iglesias was a bona fide superstar by the time. Masses were, you know, lining up to buy tickets, and he performed to sold out stadiums. and. It's one thing to do a nice record and a nice video, but it's another to perform live and still, you know, make the audience fall in love with you. I'm coming over to your house tomorrow. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Uh, come on over. Sorry, she's gonna talk to me. Keep you on. Talk <laughs> about that. Words. Couple yeah, words. Couple words. Everybody. Okay, it's a big sure. night tonight. What do you think of your category? It's a huge category. It's a fun night. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's good to be performing here. It's yeah. fun. That's a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. To be able to sing here. Yeah. 
How'd you guys end up together? Uh, <laughs> we just did a video. I just did his latest video with him. Enrique Chavez. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Enrique, tell us about Latin music. It's so crazy now. It's such a big thing for a lot of fans. Now, what do you feel about it's, it? It's good. I mean, it's really pop music, you know? It's just sang by Latino artists. But it's, it's really about the pop. Yeah, do you think it's right now, why is it so hot? Because of you, it's just so No, but it's good music. Ricky, Mark, uh, Jennifer, a bunch of good artists out there. Okay, thank you. Right. I remember Dave Adelson from Real quickly, you get out of the limo and you do, you've done so many of these lines. Dynamic walking. From here, Enrique won an American Music Award for Favorite Latin Artist, cementing his status in the Latin music scene. Throughout 1998 and 1999, Enrique began his successful crossover to English language music. This is a big deal. Okay, he lost the year before, but now he's winning the award and he's beating Ricky Martin. And at the time, nobody was bigger than Ricky Martin. So this was really saying something that the fans voted for Enrique over Ricky. And it probably was a little bit of poetic justice winning that final, you know, the year after. I wish every son would have the opportunity to get this public acknowledgement, you know, when they're in a quarrel with their father and when they're trying to establish themselves. But I think this is just what Enrique needed, is win the award that he was fighting for the year before and lost to his father. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Tigres del Norte and, and Enrique Martin. They're both, they're both great, you know. It was, it was great to be nominated with them. Uh, was I pretty confident that I was going to win? Uh, I thought I was going to win last year, and I lost. I thought I was going to lose this year, and I won. You know? But, uh, I don't know. I, I, had a, I had a little bit of faith. Yeah, thank you. Enrique signed a multi-million dollar deal with Interscope. Enrique reportedly was good friends with Gerardo, which a lot of people remember from the early 90s because of his song Rico Suave. And when Enrique consulted him about what to do, Gerardo was like, you should come to Interscope, we'll treat you like a star, and he ended up signing with the label, and well, obviously it was a, a really good decision for him. It took about two months for him to complete the album, and when it was done, it was a really big deal because it went platinum. Signing with Interscope was a huge step for Enrique and a little bit of a risk for the record label because you never know how um, the artists translate from Latin America to Northern America or the world. I'm a very big fan from Enrique Iglesias. He's my favorite person who sings. Also, my favorite song is Balamos. Balamos is one of the coolest songs I think. Why do you like it so much? I'm not sure why I like it. It just it's sometime when just when I heard it, I liked it. It was weird. Wait, which concert? This one. Tell them how what happened. Which concert? Tell them what happened just now. Did you see it? What concert? Right now, this one. Enrique on stage. Oh yes, I saw. I saw this con. I saw the concert. It was very um, kind of. Wait, actually, I didn't see the concert. <laughs> we Why just. Not? We just because we wanted to get our autograph from Enrique Iglesias, so we hurried hurried um to here to the line so we can um, get it, get our autograph quicker. Because we don't want to be in line for like all the way until like 12 o'clock. And I have a ping pong paddle, my mom bought it. And she's gonna, um, we're gonna get Enrique to sign it. Because the, there's a ping pong song and we got a ping pong paddle. It's funny. <laughs> Will Smith approached Enrique after one of his concerts to see if he wanted to contribute to the soundtrack of Wild Wild West. So Will Smith had actually attended one of Enrique's concerts and saw how fans just went crazy over him and he was convinced that Enrique should be on the soundtrack of the movie. The song actually went to the number one spot and two versions of it were shot. Uh, one specifically for um, the movie where Enrique was sort of in a wild, wild west setting. And another one was a little bit more generic where uh, you could see Enrique in a nightclub with a big old disco ball and a couple of very sexy dancers, you know, dancing to, to his number.
He asked Enrique to do a song for the movie. He agreed, of course, Bailamos was a, a big, huge hit for him. It establishes him not only in the music industry, but also in the film industry. And what's fun about the video is he's dressed like a cowboy. Um, he's, you know, on the wanted poster. You've got um, very hot, sexy dancing girls. You've got clips from the film. So you even throw a Will Smith in there. And this, again, is that great crossover of pop culture success for him. Playing a little bit with his Latin image, taking it not so serious. He was wearing um, Western garb, a long dust coat and a hat, and there were women with dwelling cleavage, and you know, it was not serious, but he knows exactly which strings to pull. Bailamos, featured on the album titled Enrique, which was the title of his first full English album with Interscope. It featured a duet song with Whitney Houston entitled Could I Have This Kiss Forever. Anytime you get an opportunity to do um, a duet with Whitney Houston, it's a really big deal. And at the time, too, Whitney was still at the the peak of her career. She hadn't hit sort of uh, that downfall that she had later on, but... What you see in the video is you see lots of hookups going on, lots of hot, sexy girls, and you see a wet Enrique in the pool. We're going to sit there and solidify that Latin sexy musician, and that's exactly what you see in the video. Although no hookups between Whitney and Enrique. The single was actually the first song released as part of Whitney Houston's Greatest Collections album. It wasn't as big of a hit here in the U.S., but it did peak in other countries internationally. In the video, you can actually see them in some sort of you know, remote home and everybody just seems in heat, everybody seems to be sweaty and uh, Enrique and Whitney are playfully flirting with each other in the video but you can tell that they're not really going for that, uh, I guess they're not trying to play lovers in the video but uh, there was a little bit of friendly interaction with them in there. It reintroduced Enrique as a Latin lover um, including the open, the unbuttoned shirt and the necklace and the golden hoose, the skin tones, and the Spanish guitar going very well with Whitney's soul and funk, and it was just a love fest, an international love fest. The music industry was changing for the better. Enrique and other Latino pop stars were a force to be reckoned with. They had showed the world they were here to stay and would change the music industry forever. Yeah, this time period was really interesting for Latino artists because for so long they had been, it was the Latin Grammys, it was the Latin market. That was all that they were sort of relegated to. But now with uh, taking their influence in Latin music and mixing it with a pop sound, they were able to sort of infuse that and cross over into mainstream radio. And this was a really big time for emerging artists that has led the way now all the way through um, you know, the current type of climate that we see in the music industry. And that was important. So they were really kind of pioneers for establishing Latino artists. This was a huge time for Latinos and the Latin music industry. So much so that, I mean, record execs now were not just calling it Spanish music, they were calling it Latin pop. And they were giving a lot more publicity, much more importance to um, developing and signing artists such as Enrique, Ricky Martin, and Jennifer Lopez. 
Latin music was very folkloric in a way before superstars like Ricky Martin and Enrique Iglesias showed up. It was not a, a big thing in the US outside of the Hispanic community and these guys really united the tastes of the Americas and that was unprecedented, I think. From here, Enrique performed live at the Super Bowl in 2000 alongside Cristina Aguilera, Phil Collins, and Tony Braxton. Enrique was criticized for his performance by the radio show host Howard Stern. Stern told listeners that Enrique could not sing live and played them a tape of his singing out of tune. In response to this, Enrique decided to go on Howard Stern's show and sing live. Well, Enrique wanted to shut down all rumors about his singing, and he actually decided to go to Howard Stern's show and perform live, uh, despite the fact that some of his closest friends and record execs were a little bit reluctant about him doing this because they said, look, you're going to go to this show early in the morning, your voice is probably going to be cracking, and, you know, you just your pipes aren't going to be there. But Enrique actually... Uh, proved everyone wrong. Okay, to perform at the Super Bowl is one of the pinnacles of any musician's career. Everyone wants to perform at that halftime show. You also have to remember, though, you're in a huge stadium. It is so hard with the sound bouncing and the acoustics going all over the place. So someone recorded him probably at a bad moment. They could have altered the sound in the studio as well. So Enrique said, you know what? I'm going to prove you wrong. He came in, did the acoustic set on Howard Stern, and Howard actually went out and said, you know what? I respect you for coming here, and you really can sing. And later on, Enrique said, this was the best promotion of my career ever because so many people follow Howard Stern and what he says. And you know what, if Howard's like, you know what, I was wrong, man, I was wrong, there you go. In 2001, Enrique released his second and most successful English album to date, which was titled Escape. What Enrique didn't realize was that shooting this video would change his personal life forever. Well, Escape was not only a success, but it actually ended up being uh, the place where Enrique met what many consider the love of his life, Anna Kournikova. Um, in the video, they get all hot and steamy and they're interacting in the beach. And well, one thing led to another and the romance went from on screen to off screen. Escape is his biggest commercial success to date. And that's a, a really big deal. It did extremely well, not only overseas, but it did really well in North America. He had two hit singles coming off of that. And this was the one, like peak of his career, no one could touch Enrique. You've got to remember that they didn't know each other before this video. So um, it's hot, it's sexy. He's hooking up with her all over the place, everywhere from inside the car, in the bathroom. And you could see the chemistry was right there. Very successful single for them, but I think it was more successful for his personal life. With Enrique finally meeting Anna Kornikova, it kind of proved the fact that he could be a one woman man. Um, his father was obviously a ladies' man. You know, women would go crazy over him. But Enrique was willing to settle down with this, you know, famous tennis player, uh, despite the fact that he could have had many women, any other woman. So it kind of proved that, you know, he, he wanted to settle down a bit. In the UK, the album's first single, Hero, became a number one hit. It was released just after the 9-11 attacks and touched the hearts of many. Local radio DJs mixed the song with police and firefighter radio communications as a tribute. In the video, you can see him and Jennifer Love Hewitt playing some sort of runaway lovers. They're escaping Mickey Rourke in the video, throwing money around, and uh, eventually Enrique is seen on the floor amongst all this rain, bleeding, and... Uh, it, it, they lead us to believe that he's he's dead at the end of the video, so it was very dramatic. The song was also used as part of the campaign for Jeep Liberty. I love this music video because Hero has a very hot Jennifer Love Hewitt. Mickey Rourke also stars in this, and it's that classic sort of uh, bandit on the run. Um, obviously, they've maybe robbed a few banks, they've got a lot of money. It does end very tragically with Enrique being shot to death because he's caught by the cops. But, you know, it's a very sultry um, song. However, 
during after 9-11, it became one of the anthems for a lot of the emergency service um, policemen, firemen, EMTs um, that lost their lives in the tragedy. It's a little, it has some Bonnie and Clyde, it has some breathless Richard Gere or Jean-Paul Raimondo. It's every, every male archetype you can think of. It's an amazing show, but you Thank made you. a girl cry because she was so mean. Well, hopefully I didn't make her cry for something else, so that's not a bad thing. No, it was, it was fun. You love to get girls from stage with you, though, don't you? I just like it because it's that moment of intimacy where you, you, you just concentrate on that person and, and you forget whether you're in front of 60,000 people or, or six people. You forget about everything at that moment and you're just concentrating on that one person. And it's such a personal song. You know, obviously there's always um, people can say it's cheesy, it's whatever, but to me, it feels real. To me, it feels, um, I truly do it because I feel, um, it just feels real at that moment. So I can't, uh, I just can't stop. Sometimes I don't, I mean, it, it all depends, you know, it's, it's, it's about that impulse thing. And you never know who's gonna come up on stage. Have you ever done it in front of Anna? She must be a little bit there. No girls up on stage. She was here today, so she was cool with it. Um, do English girls react differently to other girls? Are they like a bit more like crying and stuff? No. No. No, I think I think it's uh, I think the English the British audience is amazing. But it's Oh? How long are you gonna be in London before you hang out? Uh twenty four hours. Yeah. Because you've got to get into I go back to the States. Now, after the tour, are we going to get back in the studio? Cause yeah, I'm going straight into the studio. Oh, good. Because everyone was a bit worried when the greatest hits came out in Spain. That's well, it. He's finished. He's well, packing up. Hopefully I'm not finished, but you never know. <laughs> yeah, I'll, be, I'll tell you a year from now. I, I mean, I was finished because it was, it was, that's what the record company wanted. A lot of times, you know, you people don't understand that it's not only up to the artist. You know, you, you got obligations uh, with a contract, and they wanted out of greatest hits. Any special video ideas? Not yet, not yet. First, I want to concentrate on songs, make sure the songs are the best possible. Are you tempted to get Anna in another video, or are you going to have another course? You know, I don't like to mix that. Uh, I really don't. It feels awkward to me to mix your personal life. Now, that doesn't mean I'm never going to do it, but I, I, right now, it would feel awkward. You know, I, I, try to, I try to separate my personal life as much as possible. You know, one is just completely, completely different. I love what I do but I don't want to mix it with, with my personal life. Because it is my life, you know? So you, you need that you need that balance, sorry. So collaborations then, because there are quite a few amazing people here. There's yeah. like Richie and things. So you're going to drop Well, I actually car? sang with Lionel Richie already, and we're good friends. Um, I have a song with Akon that we've done and a few things, but I still don't know what's going to make the album. It all depends. And very quickly, have you been in the wars? What have you been doing? Oh, no, no, no. You know, I took like a four-day vacation, and I was water skiing, and I just got cut. That's it. Uh, not female fans clawing No, 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 no. <laughs> Just you went through the crowd, you get a bit scared that you might get No, you know, there's what, that'd be the best way to die. Between fans. <laughs> Fantastic. So All right, guys, take care. Thank Bye. Thank you. Enrique released his fourth Spanish album, Quizas, in 2002. It was a polished version of his previous work, and the title track talked about the strained relationship between Enrique and his father. Quizas, which means perhaps in English, apparently talked about uh, Enrique's relationship with his father, and it kind of uh, hinted to the fact that the relationship was strained and that, I guess, you know, Quizas, perhaps, it could have been better, but it wasn't. Yeah, I think what you're seeing is that Enrique at this point is growing as an artist, so he has a more mature sound, and the songs were also a little bit more introspective, so it's not just this young guy that's in his early 20s, this is a guy that's thinking a little bit more about life. Cuisas combined the best of both worlds. He, he was, Enrique learned a lot by performing for um, Northern American audiences and being signed with an American label, and he brought this experience into his um, Latin 
a release and it is as close to perfect as it gets. In 2003, Enrique released another successful album. Seven was one of Enrique's biggest albums. Um, a huge tour followed it, and uh, another big single came out of it, which was called Addicted. This one is kind of interesting because um, it was directed by Peter Berg. A lot of people know Peter Berg from directing Friday Night Lights and directing um, Lone Survivor. So it has a very stylized look. And in the video, he knew right away that um, he wanted to create something really interesting based off the movie Midnight Express. So you see Misha Barton in there. You see different elements, different scenes that uh, we've seen from the movie. Um, so kind of a departure for Enrique Iglesias because we're used to just seeing him hot, sexy, in the club, dancing with girls, making out with someone. This one was definitely more cinematic. Between 2005 and 2007, Enrique decided to take a well-deserved break. The girlfriend, remember, 2005 was one of those years that the rumors about his marriage or supposed marriage to Anna Kornikova surfaced. So he spent a lot of time with her. There were a lot of photos of them on vacation in hot locations in their bathing suits making out on the beach. During this two-year hiatus, uh, Enrique was able to refocus and, you know, able to focus a little bit more on his career and what his next move was going to be. After Enrique's hiatus, he went on to release Insomniac. The album was aptly named due to it being recorded at night. It features the single Push, featuring Lil Wayne, which also appears in the film Step Up 2, The Streets. With Push, I think it's really important to see that there's an evolution to Enrique's music. He's willing to explore his sound. He's willing to go in other directions and not just stay a Latin artist or just a pop singer. So he's definitely willing to evolve even more than that. With the video, we are talking a lot of voyeurism. We're talking a lot of uh, sex tapes. We're talking a lot of uh, orgies. A lot of things going on in this video. Definitely edgy for Enrique. Push was probably the first time that we saw a raunchier side of Enrique Iglesias. Um, in the video, he seems to be seducing a stripper who's behind like a glass wall with some red lighting. It kind of looks like the red light district. And the lyrics were definitely much raunchier. It's, you know, push, push back on it. Um, you don't see Lil Wayne in the video, but it does show that he wanted to, um, I guess, break out of his image of just being a romantic ballad artist. You know, he had a little bit more of a hip hop influence in this video. You know, I put 12, I mean 12, uh, th three years of work in this album, a lot of hours in the studio, a lot, a lot of hours. I put my heart and soul into this album, and I wrote so, so many songs. So hopefully they'll enjoy it as much as I enjoy it. I mean, I, I truly, truly believe in this album, and I'm willing to fight for it, I mean, fight for it all the way. Enrique certainly made an impressive return in 2008. The single Can You Hear Me was chosen as the official song of UFR Euro 2008, which he sang live in Vienna, Austria. In the same year, Enrique also released his greatest hits album, appropriately named 9508. Enrique also won two World Music Awards for Best Latin Performer and the world's best-selling Spanish artist. Yeah, th this is one of those banner years. He had a successful album with greatest hits, not only in Spanish, but also in English. He did both of them. He had also performed at UEFA um, at the 
football tournament. This had to have been a huge accomplishment for Enrique, not only because his father was actually a player for, a soccer player for Real Madrid, but this was a 360 for him. I mean, like, the, the World Cup is one of the biggest sporting events, or if not the biggest sporting event in the world, and for him to have uh, been chosen to be the singer of the official song for it, uh, he must have been very proud of that. It's surprising he didn't went down on his knees. That was basically what I think one of his personal highlights in his career, performing at the UEFA Cup. This is a big moment in his career because you have to remember that football is huge over in Europe and it's an honor not only to sing the song, but it's also an honor when you see your country win. So very exciting time for him. Not only did these awards solidify him as a worldwide artist, obviously, but it really showed that he had come out of his father's shadow and was no longer just, you know, his father's son. He was just, you know, a name on his own. He was Enrique Iglesias, and he perhaps at that point was more popular than his father had ever been. This is establishing him on a global scale. This is not just a Latino artist. This is not just a crossover U.S. artist. He is famous everywhere. I love Enrique. He's so awesome. He's an amazing artist. I'm like his number one fan. I'm in love with him. I'm here to see Enrique. Enrique, I've been here since 9 in the morning. I've been waiting to see him really this close for so many years. I don't know. I've always gone to his concerts. You can never get this close, though. And um, just because he's so down to earth, he's, he's wonderful. He always stays with the people. <laughs> he's the only like real artist that interacts with the crowd ever. He's just awesome. He's loves his fans and I love him. His eyes. His pretty eyes. <laughs> Euphoria was Enrique's ninth studio album and was released in 2010. It was released under his new label, Universal Republic, and contained the hit single, I Like It, with rapper Pitbull. I feel good. I feel um, extremely satisfied with this album. Um, it's tough making an album because you truly never know. You go into it, uh, you hope for the best. Sometimes you get those magical moments, sometimes you don't. I feel like I was able to accomplish, hopefully, four, five, six of those uh, moments that um, I feel fans are going to appreciate. Yeah, of course, it's the first bilingual album. How does it feel after all of this to finally have it out? It feels good. It's the type of album I always wanted to make. Uh, the good thing is that the fans have the choice of, of being able to pick either one or um, with more Spanish or one with more English. Okay. Now, why did you decide to find me? Um, I really just went with the flow. Uh, at the time, I liked that I was being that I was able to write in English and Spanish and combine both of them. I kind of created like this internal competition between one language and the other, um, and I felt it, it 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 paid off. It made when I say paid off, it made the album more interesting to me uh, when it came down to uh, the process of making it. For many years, actually, many years. Been like since '95, I think, or '96, something like that. Um, a great singer, and uh, we support him very much. Yeah, how excited are you for this particular album? I'm very excited. I haven't heard anything yet. Just the, I think the Lionel Richie song I just heard and loved it. Loved it very much. So I'm very excited. I'm happy to, to be here and to listen to the whole album. Yeah, of course, this is actually his first bilingual album. Is that surprising to you? Is it? Is it? But he's done a couple of singles in English, right? But not the whole album. Oh, this is great. That's great. I'm so happy for him and just wishing him well. <laughs> Both ways, you know, there's so much passion. And he has, you know, that very peculiar um, voice that, you know, you cannot confuse him. You just know it's Enrique. Yeah, this one lot won a lot of awards. I mean, we're talking about... Uh, not only for top Latin album, but Latin album of the year. It's one of those things, he won Latin Grammy for it. This is really a big deal too, because you're looking at, uh, he's having the ability to record songs in both Spanish and English and have them on the same album. So it's not like he has to record separate albums anymore. Now, what will people get on the deluxe edition? How is it different? Uh, they get, um, I think one, they're able to pick up to, I think, $1,000 of free items in Target, anything they want. Are you kidding? No. They can, they can uh, they get four extra songs um, and more 
more content in there. I wish I could put this. Actually, this is this is the album. This is the one. This one's my favorite. I wish I could put this one out everywhere, but Target's been uh, especially uh, great with me. So I, I, I feel like it's a it's a special place to release this album. I'm a pretty big Enrique fan. I've been listening to him since I was little. You know that sort of thing. So I'm really excited to be here. I'm actually really honored. So I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm. I've been seeing posters everywhere. I was just in San Diego with my family. It was all over the place. So I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing you know what what new stuff he's come up with. So now this is actually his first album. Right. Are you sort of surprised to learn that? Um, a little bit, but. With the way music's going, not really. You know, I, I'm bilingual and that sort of thing. So it's, you know, it's kind of how things are going right now. So I'm, I'm really excited and, and glad to see that everybody's taking a step, you know, in a different direction. So I'm really happy about that. I have to hear a little bit more English stuff. You know, I'm, I'm still deciding. Oh my God, I almost fell. Um, <laughs> no, but um, I love his I love his Spanish stuff. I've loved his English stuff. So I mean, he's great either way. Absolutely. Now, what do you hope fans take away from the album? I hope they like it. I hope they enjoy it as much as I enjoy it. Now, of course, you've got the music video with the Jersey Shore cast, and I believe it was shot here. Is that correct? No, it wasn't shot here. There was two versions shot here, and this was the other one. Okay. So now, why did you decide to to throw the Jersey Shore guys in? I thought, you know, I got to meet them. Uh, they were great guys. They were down to earth. They were so easy to work with. And um, I'm a fan of the show. I like, I like. Obviously, you get the drama, you get the fighting, you get all of that. Um, but when it truly comes down to it, um, they're great. They're great kids. And and actually, I was doing Jay Atlanta tonight, and one of the cast members was on, and they're always very nice. And and again, they were very, they're very easy to work with. What was it like shooting that day? What was sort of the fun, the best moment between takes with those guys? Um, it's always good when you get to know people uh, that you've only seen on cam or you've only seen on the screen, and 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 you you don't know what to expect. And um, in this case, um, I could I guess I could say my career I've worked with people that are easier to work with than others, and these. Guys were very, very easy to work with, and they were very down to earth, which is good to see, especially from from guys that came from one day not being known at all to suddenly being extremely popular. Absolutely. Lastly, how do you feel about Target's overall commitment to the arts? I feel really good about that. Like I said, um, Target is uh, one of the few, and you can tell everything they do with music. It's not. Um, it's it's not easy nowadays. It's 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 a, it's a dying breed and they're still supporting it. This album was, again, another big hit for Enrique Iglesias. It was probably the first time that Universal and Universal Music Latino had joined forces to promote an album because Enrique had songs in both English and Spanish. He didn't do um, one album for one market and the other for, you know, the Spanish market. He, had, he was targeting both markets in that, um, in that album. He had a number one hit with Cuando Me Enamoro, which was a duet with Juan Luis Guerra, which was in Spanish and was also the theme song of a telenovela. And another one of the breakout songs of that album was I Like It with Pitbull. Again, it kind of broke that goody-goody ballad singer image that he had. Um, in the video, there were two versions of it, actually. There was one with the cast of Jersey Shore, because the song was uh, part of the soundtrack of that reality show. And then there was another version of that uh, music video that was also done with Pitbull in which the Jersey cast, excuse me, the Jersey Shore cast was not featured and you could see Pitbull and Enrique partying at what looked like some sort of restaurant nightclub venue with, you know, sexy women and, you know, hitting each other with pillows and whatnot. Um, and the album, excuse me, the single actually peaked within the top 10 spots in several countries.
Enrique released another single, Turn the Night Up, in 2013 from his upcoming album, Sex and Love. This one's very psychedelic for him. Um, you know, he walks into a house. You don't know if it's a dream or if it's a film and what's happening. Um, it's very Black Swan, sort of psychological. Um, kind of a departure for him, but very, very interesting. In the other video, when we're talking about I'm a Freak, this is his third collaboration with Pitbull. So you're seeing that he is working with artists again and again because he knows that they're successful. They have good chemistry. Their sounds work together. And again, they go right back to that party scene. You see hot and sexy Enrique hanging out with lots of pretty ladies. Turn the Night Up actually debuted at number 30 in the charts. And I'm a Freak was just a, another play on how crazy he'd you know, become over the years. In the video, you can actually see him in a sort of frat house party setting with women booty shaking. And at one point, you can actually see Enrique patting on one of their butts and, you know, kind of like laying on, on one of the model's butts as well. It's, it was just a huge departure from uh, some of the earlier videos we had seen in his career. Enrique has definitely proved that he has a range and that he can uh, combat all sorts of different genres. Now he's a little bit more into like the dance, techno, pop genre, whereas before we would see him doing a lot of ballads. Um, and his image has also changed. You know, in the beginning, we would see him doing a lot of slower, more romantic songs. And now we see him doing a lot of uh, songs, you know, dance songs with artists like Pitbull or uh, Lil Wayne. It really has developed because if you take a look at uh um, the very first album that he did, you know, it has a very Latin sound. You know exactly what you're going to get. But as each album grows, he goes from just a Latino artist to a crossover artist, and he hits that whole pop culture sort of status on the radio. But then he goes, okay, I need to move forward. I need to change my sound up. And he's continued to do that with each album, and he understands where the music industry is going. Enrique is um, a very well-rounded artist. He started out as this Latin lover. He experimented with all kinds of uh, different genres. He was flirting a little bit with rap, with rock, with everything. And I think by now he has really found himself. Enrique Iglesias, still one of the leading musicians in the world, continues to sell out arenas, blow fans away, shift millions of copies of albums, and collaborate with some of the best talent in the world. But what does the future hold for the Latino heartthrob? Well, Enrique has left everyone up in the air about his future. While he hasn't, you know, dismissed the possibility of getting married to someone, you know, he says that he, you know, it wouldn't make him necessarily happier. But he has said that he wouldn't mind having kids, but if that were to happen, that he would want to settle down a bit and not tour as much. Uh, he's definitely not going anywhere. He is worth an estimated $45 million. So we have a lot more Enrique to see. You know, I think it's going to be one of those things that uh, maybe he and Anna Kornikova will get it together. Maybe they'll have a kid. Who knows? But uh, I think he's really going to focus in on his career and evolving that sound even more. So watch out. I don't think he's going anywhere. Enrique shows no signs of slowing down. He will continue to dominate the music industry for years to come.